Today, I'm pleased to be joined with former Canadian national team player, Canada Soccer Hall of Famer and Olympian, as well as four-time CONCACAF champion, Amy Walsh. Amy, how are you doing today? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Really appreciate your time to join me here today, obviously to talk about the massive news that broke last month from your former teammate, Diana Matheson, and her business partner, Thomas Gilbert, who have set plans to launch a professional women's soccer league here in Canada by 2025. We've got two major sponsors already committed, two teams already announced. We're going to have four from the East, four from the West. I mean, how massive is this piece of news? It's fabulous. It's a long time coming. Uh, You know, I've talked about this before, but they win bronze in 2012. And somewhat ironically, Diana, who scores that game winning goal is the one who's finally going to be bringing this league into fruition. So but my original point was you think that momentum early on was what was going to bring the league doesn't happen. 2016, they win yet another bronze still doesn't happen. Kind of momentum comes and goes. And then they win the gold in Tokyo. They think, okay, finally, the league is going to come and then. Nothing. So the I think the somewhat sobering thought is that it takes a former player with a great business mind and intelligence like Diana to to sort of table this and to to build it. And then obviously, you know, the two teams that are on board already and, and the sponsors and CIBC and, and Aeroplan is, is a great start. But it takes a former player to actually get the wheels in motion. So that's the sobering thought. But the good thing and the positive with all that is I think it's going to spur along um, the federation. It's going to spur along more sponsors and and hopefully more, more teams and, and owners that will also come to the forefront. Like you mentioned, Canada is one of the last nations to jump on board and have a league, which means we're slightly late to the party. Oh, yeah, we're well late. We're embarrassingly late. <laughs> I mean, what learning opportunities does this provide, if anything? Sure. I, I think you can you can use other leagues, not necessarily as a template, because I think Canada is unique in our in our geography. And also, if you look at the professional sports landscape, we're typically mm-hmm. piggybacking on existing infrastructure. And if you look at leagues that have perhaps really um, exploded over the last uh, four to five years, like the Women's Super League in England or um, the Primera League in Spain, and how that has just really caused their national team to to shoot up also in, in performance and in, and in results. They have piggybacked on the existing infrastructure of the men's club game, which we don't really have in Canada here. We don't have the luxury of doing that. And you look at the NWSL and, you know, um, having to, to, to reconcile sort of the growth of, of this boom in women's sport and how quickly it's growing, how viewership's increasing, setting records for the NWSL final, but also reckoning or, or the reckoning with the, you know, the culture of abuse and these, the, the Hayes report and all this sort of stuff that's coming out of it. So I think certainly Canada can learn from all of those things. Um, but I think you look at the CPL, which is which is a fledgling league. Um, I think is really important that that survives. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think the great thing about women's sports is, as I mentioned, it's it's in a pe- really a period of of ascension and of incredible growth that we have to capitalize on that. But we're going to be able to find kind of niche, as it were, um, investors, um, business minds, people who are eager to participate who maybe weren't before because there wasn't really a market for them. So we're going to find new markets to explore in terms of communities, in terms of fans, um, in terms of you know stadiums and all that sort of stuff, but also discover new minds and and new blood also as as it were um in, in order to to really build this league and so it's really important that it's sustainable so i think certainly lessons to be gleaned from um you know you you look at the top 20 in the world canada in the most recent fifa rankings was sixth the only country in that top 20 to not mm-hmm. have a domestic pro league so you can certainly learn lessons where other countries and leagues have have maybe made missteps and recovered and continue to grow and from the get-go um in in canada here in 2025 we can hopefully do things right so that it so that it's really um thriving um as much as it can um from that first kickoff like you mentioned we've seen the potential on the international level we recently captured gold as well but also we have seen the u17 and the u20 is kind of crash out early in in their world cups most recently the u17 canada has one of the biggest talent pools of soccer but that has been thinning out recently and obviously you work very closely with cf montreal and their academy with the development of women's soccer do you think an announcement like this kind of rejuvenates this and, and starts reversing what we're seeing in 
the, the pool of talent. I think it, it, it injects that, that interest and, um, you know, for, for young women who are finishing college, whether they take the NCA route or the, the, they explore the U sports uh, route here in Canada, which has been bolstered of late, a lot of really talented players who are coming out of there. And, and partic- in particular, Quebec, Co- yeah. Quebec has always had, I mean, soccer is the most practiced sport has always had tons and tons of talent, but when the NCAA was the only route where you could really develop and, and further your game, you were losing a lot of these um, Quebec born players because of the language barrier. Mm-hmm. So I think this league will remove some of those barriers for, for not only Canadian, they don't necessarily have to cross a border in order to, to develop and in order to, to play competitively, which is, I think, a huge gap when we look at that pyramid uh, that, that was missing. So this league will provide that peak of, of the pyramid, but then I think you, you know, the league ones of the world in BC and Ontario and PLSQ here um, in my own backyard in Quebec, um, we were still going to need to find something to, to be tier two. And I think you continue to grow, you continue to deepen that player pool as you alluded to, but you give, and again, part of my mandate with CF Montreal is offering these, these young women, you know, 15, 17, um, age when you're done university, 22, Mm -hmm. 23, a a place to play, a a place to grow and a different pathway, an alternative um, to the pro game, which, Mm -hmm. which is growing so rapidly as we talked about right off the top. So I think it's essential that this league gets, gets created. Um, the wheels are in motion. It's going to happen. I've heard a lot of naysayers, people who are doubting. You know, I think D's announcement during the World Cup when all the eyes were on on the game was was a really ideal time to announce. But then I think you also got on the the other side of the coin, you got people saying, well, wait a minute, this is just a template. This isn't a league. Mm-hmm. But, you know, be, be patient. You know, the right people are are, are in there and, and this league is is going to is going to get done. And so I th- to go back to your original question about that player pool, I think our youth system has been undernourished. You know, like the grassroots is very strong. We're going to get the top of that pyramid. And we also have the elite that's growing very well with our talent being outsourced, mm-hmm. as it were, the, the elite players being shipped overseas or uh, down and playing in the NWSL and doing fantastically um you know like the julia grosso's of the world who are killing it at juventus rumored to move to man city sabrina d'angelo who's rumored to be making the move to arsenal that should get announced in any day now (laughs) Um, you know clarissa uh laracy who is at celtic and now is in um in in the swedish division Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and that's just the, the tip of the iceberg, right? Vanessa, yeah. Vanessa Gill and Jesse, Buc- uh, Jesse Fleming, Buchanan playing at Chelsea in a Champions League. The cast, just a prolific scorer for Benfica, right? I mean, I, we could, we could, the whole, our whole conversation could just be listing their accomplishments <laughs> yeah. in, our, in the club game, right? But then once we stop talking about sort of that, that elite, the upper echelon in our yeah. country, everybody that Bev Priestman already knows, yeah. There are so many other players, so mm-hmm. many more Canadian talents, so many more Quebec-born talents who are also Canadian, but yeah. <laughs> close to close to home because this yeah. is where I come from. So many players we don't yet know their names. So it's really important that you know we build academies, um, which I'm hoping to do short term with CF Montreal. TFC needs to get on board. Thank Steph you. Labbe is doing great stuff with Whitecaps. They've yeah. always been. Again, you know, um, dodgy stuff happening behind the scenes with with abuse and the Bob Berarda, uh just nightmare um, yeah. sort of management and, and sexual abuse aside, they've always been heavily invested in, in the women's game. So you get the right people in charge. They are doing mm-hmm. fabulous things in, in Vancouver, but we have to keep pushing for that so that players aren't falling through cracks and that that player pool is is expanded or is deepened and we're not just talking about the upper layer Mm. but then there's also you know all of the sub layers and all of those players who are there can get developed and and nourished because we also you know the uh, talking to emma humphreys Mm. and to cindy ty um with the u17s and then u20 teams they both crashed out of the in the group stages as you alluded to 
And we can help them succeed by creating infrastructure because they certainly don't have a ton of money that they're playing with in order to develop those players, not a lot of time together. So if we take them out of an environment of the NCAA where they're only, sorry, this is very long-winded, where they're only playing elite soccer for four months of the year. And I went down to the NCAA. I went to Nebraska. It was the best decision I ever made in terms of my career. But that was 20 years ago. Things are changing. There are alternatives now. So we need to create something here in Canada for these women to really develop and grow the game. Yeah, it almost sounds like we're seeing the tip of the iceberg and under everything under the water, the remainder of the iceberg where that talent, that youth system, uh, all those numbers that are going over to the NCAA or in the US, we're diminishing their talent, we're diminishing their potential to go professional. And in the nicest way, really, we're killing what we could breed so much of. There is, There's still this debate about NWSL versus... Uh, domestic Canadian league, you know, 12 to, to 15. I, I, I'm not sure the exact number who are going to be involved in the NWSL draft mm-hmm. um, for this year, I think taking place today, yeah. um, which is great. Um, and another avenue to to explore, right? And take take the opportunity if it presents itself. But if we yeah. have a league at home with, with eight teams and a roster of 25, you know, you, you do the math. My math is yeah. poor, but that's way more than 12 to 15 in an NWSL draft, right? And also the opportunity, and Diane has talked about this. Um, I've been on podcasts and been on the radio talking about this. Mm-hmm. You also have everything that holds up that roster. You have opportunities to develop female coaches, to develop female referees, game op- game ops, administrative, or administrators, um, people in management, uh, ownership groups that are female-led. Like it, the, 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 you can just go down the line and all of these opportunities to, to invest in women, but in Canadian women. Yeah. And just kind of on that point that you mentioned, you've seen Rianne Wilkinson do great work with Portland Thorns in the NWSL. We also in Liga MX winning trophies there. And so not only are we able to see that brilliance on the field, that brilliance also is taking place off the field with uh, managing success as well. Sarah's, which you touched on recently, will probably want to diminish that, but the fact is we've got 15 million fans across of Canada. Uh, we've also seen that potential and that talent thrive all across of Europe and on the international stage when they come into international camps. The Men's World Cup has stirred a lot of conversation at the end of last year. The women's are also go- going into the World Cup in six months. And so this has to be breeding a lot of success. I said it a long, long time coming. And I think, you know, there will be though the inherent challenges that exist. I, again, I, I talked about it at, at, off the top with, with the geography, but mm. I think what Diana has conceptualized and it was almost inspired by, um, sounds strange to say inspired by COVID, but the way that teams were able to continue playing in COVID uh, environment and if COVID affected uh, sports. So you have this bubble environment. So you, you create an opportunity for teams to play one another in a hub, and then you create an opportunity to develop the community and really give the community sort of player narratives, team narratives to get attached to, to care about. And that's how you develop fans. That's how you get sure. fans. And, you know, to, you know, you no longer open your, your, the sports page, like I like to do, I used to do when I was a kid and and look down to see how your favorite team or your, your top scores or your favorite players were doing. But now it's, you open your tab on your, on your laptop or on your computer on your phone and, and you follow, you're invested. And so I think it gives Canadians, Canadian sport fans, women's soccer fans, an opportunity to really stay engaged in the game outside of these four-year cycles where I was on a podcast with uh, Vanessa, uh, not Vanessa Schill, with uh, Evelyn Vien um, yeah. uh, at the end of this year. It was just on at the beginning of the year with uh, Radcan. And uh, was one, it was great to meet her in person, um, but it was great to hear her perspective. And she was talking about people coming up to her recently, like at the end of this past year in 2022, saying, mm-hmm. are you ready for the Olympics in Paris? You know, and she's just sort of struck by that. And um you know, the comparison with with male counterparts, not only talking about the, the gender pay gap that we won't even get into because that's a whole other podcast, yeah. <laughs> but just the, the the general perception of of what she did and what her her daily life was, you know, that, oh, she has a club. She plays in Sweden and there are events and, you know, there's a Women's World Cup coming up in less than six months because that's where their success has been. They've podiumed three consecutive times. 
at the Olympics, maybe for the casual sports fan, that's how they're invested. That's how they're checking in. That's how they know Evelyn. Uh, that's how they know Christine Sinclair yeah. or Diana Matheson, because that's where they've seen them have success. So you you have a league and all of a sudden you have, you have these casual sports fans who are not only checking up on players or teams, um, but they're, they're invested and they care about the narrative and they know all of a sudden that, you know, if a Christine Sinclair, you know, she maybe comes and plays at a team in, in Vancouver after she's done this current contract with yeah. Thorns. And then they'll know more about Christine. Mm-hmm. They know that, you know, she had a storied history at Thorns is the only pro team she ever played for, but then they maybe check in with, with her teammate you know, and, and know where that player went to college and, and they, and they know when, you know, that the women's national team is playing at the She Believes Cup. Yeah. You know, you have fans who, who really care about, care about the game more than just every Olympics. I mean, really, it's going to be a ripple effect and domino effect of these stories that we will get to foster here in Canada. And and just one last thing coming from a professional player like yourself who has won plenty and represented the country for over a decade. What is one message that you would send for our youth or the Canadian youth that is currently dreaming uh, of playing that professional soccer in the league that's going to launch very soon? Well, I would say make sure that you're doing it for yourself. Make sure that it's not for your brother, or your sister, or for your coach, or for your mom and dad. Make sure that you're truly passionate about your sport and you're doing it for yourself. That you're you're committed and you and you and you love the game and you're and you're ready to show up in good days and on bad days. And I would also, when I go speak to sports teams, whether it's girls teams or boys teams or schools, I always say try to play as many sports as possible. Like the the landscape has changed completely. I played every single sport when I was growing up. And I think that helped me become a better soccer player when I finally decided at probably the age of 15 or 16, which is fairly late in the game, that that was going to be the sport that I was going to commit to. And now kids are specializing a lot earlier, but I really think that playing a multitude of sports exposes you to more philosophies, exposes you to different types of people. And in the end, you will make a choice and that's okay. But then you, you have sort of this you've gleaned all kinds of knowledge and lessons from these other sports that you can apply to the one that you've chosen and the last thing I'd say and it's one that I got from Marnie McBean because she was I mean the storied rower for for Canada and um, she said to us in a trip to uh, China one year she were at the uh, Canadian embassy in Beijing and she gave, gave a great speech and she gave us so many motivational speeches, but this one really stuck in my mind. And it was just saying, try to be the best that you can be on a bad day. So for me as a soccer player, being that number six, I was not the flashy skilled player. I was the <laughs> tackler. I was winning headers and I was passing the ball off to somebody who could probably do something better with it than I could. But it was, you know, on a day where maybe your touch isn't there or the calls aren't going your way, the weather's crap, like what can you control? And what you can control is is usually um, how hard you're working and uh, and your attitude. And so I always talk to kids about that. And if you that that whether you're going to be an elite athlete or not is, I think, a good a good life lesson. So I always tell them that try to be the best that you can possibly be on the very worst day. (laughs) That's beautiful. I can already imagine some of these soccer admirers and those who want to be uh, professional soccer for Canada in the future just smiling (laughs) at what you're saying right now. One last thing, Amy, how can people keep up with uh, the incredible work that you're doing with CF Montreal and their academy right now as well as your ongoing advocacy and um, work to call for investors um, in for Canadian soccer as well as um, women in, in sports in general? First and foremost, Project 8. Uh, I think it might be on socials. It might be Project 8 Sports, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Or just yeah. Google. Yes, the 8, the number, exactly. Uh, people don't know Diana was was number 8. I don't know if that's related, but 8 teams. She's number 8. If you don't I'll know that, yes, you got to know. <laughs> <laughs> it's kismet, right? Um, and yeah, my Twitter handle is Amy13Walsh. I'm same on Insta if you want to follow me over there. I used to personal train and I still do mobility and breath work with with uh, with athletes. I mm-hmm. actually work with the CF Montreal Academy. I did for for years prior to them hiring me for women's soccer development. So that if that's a thing, there's lots of stuff on my Instagram if you want to check that out. But no, I'm, most, I'm mostly on Twitter. Again, I want to thank you so much for joining me here for your time and um, all the knowledge that you've been able to share with us today. Looking forward to it. It was great chatting with you, Miriam. Thank you. Thank you.